there, Cynthia here. Welcome to my quilt lab. And today I'm working on this block of the month solar by Banyan Batiks by North Cobb. We're working on month number six. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's this lovely guy right here. And if you're looking for information on Banyan Batiks by North Cobb, Bad to Be Quilting, that's the designer of this beautiful quilt or Adirondack quilts. That's where I work. Take a look in the description below for all those links. And let's dig in to see what month six has in store for us. Let's go. Okay, so month six is this block. It's called the Dog Tooth Violet. You're going to be making two of these, and you can see here and here on the quilts. Let's just take a closer look at those fabrics. We're using, turn these over, Woo! fabric number three. That's these spots right here. Fabric number five is that pretty center. Then we got some fabric sixes. These are the outside pieces, these little triangles. And then fabric 11, that's this pretty little diamond that's actually in two spaces and the other squares, that is fabric 13. So let's just take a quick look because just like last month, this month has templates. So let's just take a quick look at those. All right, when you see your instructions, you'll have two pages of templates, C and D reverse, D, D reverse. These are the same pieces, one's just flipped mirrored opposite. And then there's also E with F and F reverse. And those are those, the, or I should say the complicated blocks here and here. So those corner units and then this square right here, which is pretty similar to that one we did last time. It's just the different shape, it's just different size. So that template from last month is not gonna work. You have to make this new template. So let's just review templates while I'm working on them. The Bound to Be Quilting ladies, they of course suggest making your own plastic templates using some type of acrylic. You can find this acrylic in sheets at your big box stores, or you can get them from your local quilting stores. And you can see right there that those are the pieces right there. And I actually only did the one side of D and F because all I have to do is flip them over to get the reverse side. And if you can see, I put a little R on one side so they know that that's the reverse side. Whereas if it's the plain, D and F. You can also do a quick, uh, a quick tip with this is if you stack the fabric in two layers, you know, one facing each other, you can just cut one and you'll have two of them, one the regular and one on the reverse. So that's why I, I only made the one side. If you don't like doing acrylic templates or paper templates, you can also grab your freezer paper. We talked about this a little bit in the last month's uh, template as well. So head back to last month and I, I explained this a little bit more. Basically you, you trace the templates onto this and you iron them on waxy side down onto the fabric and use that to cut around. It's a really easy method. Freezer paper is your friend. And then of course, if you've watched any of my videos, you know that I love paper piecing. And yes, I did it again with these. I made my own paper piece of the templates. And basically what I did is I first traced that center triangle, and then these two lines are these two lines. So after I traced the one side, I just measured up to the other side, did that side, and then this side, and then I went back behind and did that quarter of an inch sewing seam allowance, and I did that for both of them. Photocopied that several times so that I made enough on my handy dandy Carla Do Carol, excuse me, Carol Doak paper, so that I can paper piece them. And uh, so yeah, I'll, this is what I'm going to be doing with my blocks. This is what I, it's what I did with my first sample one. So you'll see me do this here. Uh, but I'll do, we'll do a quick talk about the template version as well, so that you can follow along with what they say in the instructions. So you get a little bit of everything this time around. So now that we've talked about the kind of whether you're going to do paper piecing or templates, I just want to grab my whiteboard and talk about cutting fabric real quick. 
All right, so here's a little diagram of what I did when I went to cut everything. Uh, remember those two fabrics, that pretty teal for the inside of the block, the very center, and the four outside ones. Those are just squares, so I won't talk about those. They're, they're super easy. Just make sure you're using, you know, accurate cutting. But for the other one, they suggest cutting them like this. So here is fabric three. So there's our length of fabric. And she says, they say, to cut the first half in this direction and the second half in this direction. So you're going to be doing these four times each way, one, one, two, three, four. And what I did for paper piecing is I just made eight separate squares or rectangles, as it were and then divided them halfway. And that's gonna be way bigger than I need for the paper piecing. Okay, so fabric six, that's this one. It's those beige ones. You can see it's a little bit taller, just a smidgen, a little bit taller. And I just did the same thing, same thing as I did this one, only they're, they laid this way instead of this way. And I just cut them all up into little, little rectangles so that I have more than enough space to either use my template or, let me grab it right here. There it is, to trace on there, or to use them on those corner pieces for the paper piecing. Lots of room. The thing I really like about this uh, program is they're giving you plenty of fabric to work with. And of course that last one, this is actually for two different pieces. It's the center triangle for each. So let me just grab my paper template. So it's that center. The nice thing is, is that the width that's still the same, it's just the height that's different. So I'll just have a bunch of extra fabric for this block right there. But I did basically the same thing as I did on that top one. I divided them all up. I made eight cut pieces, then I cut them in half diagonally and I will have more than enough to cut all these pieces. The nice, like I said, the nice thing about this pattern is there's a lot of extra fabric and that's a, it's very healthy for us in case we make any mistakes. Um, but as everything, read through all your instructions from top to the bottom before you do any cutting. Make sure you're giving your fabric a nice press. We are doing some cutting on the bias, so not a bad idea to reach for that best press or that starch and give your fabric a nice little best press or starching so that everything lays a little nicely when you go to sew it and pin everything together. All right, good times guys, good times. I've already made the one block. How about you watch me make the second block and yeah, let's get going. All right, so let's talk about the sewing directions for those two template blocks. We've already kind of touched on paper piecing versus using one of the templates. So I'm gonna do uh, one of each just so that you can see it, just like I did the last time. And uh, so let's just chat a little bit before we get going. You'll see that in the instructions, one of the peaks is placed up and the other one's placed down. So that's what I'm doing here. Please note that the, the beige with the green, all the points are going together. And the other one, that kind of uh, grayish with the green, it's opposite. So the big fat parts are opposite from one another. So one's gonna make a square and the other one makes a triangle. So just be aware of that. Keep referring back to those instructions so you get a nice look at the picture before you know heading to the sewing machine. Um, let's just chat a little bit about that templates really quick. So I'm just gonna set my paper pieces aside. So you have your you have your templates and I'm just gonna do one of those first blocks. You'll see that I of course I only did two because that D reversed is just the mirror image of it. So it's just flipped over this way. So I can actually use this template uh, to cut two at a time or cut one, cut each side separately. And that's what I've done here. So I've taken my template, I've put it on top of the fabric 
and I've traced around that. And I do want to point out, if, you, if you're able to look really closely, you'll notice that line is bigger than your template. Now I know what you're thinking, oh, it's just a little hair bigger, it's not a big deal. Well, it, that's right, it's not a big deal. But if you are trying to do something really accurate and get uh, a nice quarter inch seam, I just want to point out to do all of that stuff, all of these things, to, to really hone in to get a, an accurate block. So you get pretty points. Now, if you're just that type of person that wants to finish and get it done, hey, nothing wrong with that too. I'm just gonna say I'm looking to get as accurate as possible. So when I go to uh, cut this, I'm actually going to cut just inside of that line. So it's the exact same size as my template. And I've already done that here with this one. So it's the exact same size. I also do want to point out, you see these little notches here in the corners? And let me grab the template so you can see it. See how it's uh, they're notched? That is, per, that is part of the template. So if you look at your piece of paper, those little angles, you do want to put those on your templates because those are going to match up when you go to piece them and it's going to get rid of any, uh, you know, the dog ears that you would get when you're doing regular piecing because they're going to be on top of each other. So when you go to sew them, you'll see right there, it'll match up. And then the outside ones are going to come in handy at the end when we go to put all these pieces together in that final block. So thanks to remember, you can double up just like I'm doing here. That means I'm going to have, once I cut it, I'm going to have one on the regular side and one on the reverse side. So it cuts down on the amount of times I have to grab my rotary cutter, which is always nice. You want to make sure that you're cutting just inside that line, or if you're using the, uh, what's it called? The other template, the paper template that you're on that line exactly. And you will have enough fabric if you decide to go the paper piecing route, which I'll get to in just a second. All right, so let me just cut this real quick so you can see what I'm doing. So you can see that I'm putting my ruler because I want my blade to be right on top of that line. There's one and I'm going to do the three big sides first and then I'm going to go back and do those little notches at the end. Two. and three. And then I'm just gonna go in freehand and just make sure that I'm really on that line and I'm doing just itty bitty swipes so that I get those faux dog ears on my pieces. And there we go. So now, so that's the template I used, right? But when I open them up and I do two, I have one regular and one reversed. Pretty cool, right? Gotta make things quick. All right, so when I take this to the sewing machine, I'm gonna do one side at a time. And when I put that there and pin it, that little angle and that little point is where I'm gonna aim for for my quarter of an inch. So I'm gonna do that side, I'm gonna open it up, and then I'm gonna attach the other side, and I'm gonna do the same thing. I do one side at a time, press, then do the other side of the time press. She does not give instructions as far as pressing, so feel free to use what you like to do best. Um, because these pieces are on uh, biases or diagonals, I have used best press on them. That just helps me make sure the fabric won't have any stretch when I go to take it to the sewing machine. And uh, you could do that now or you could do that before you cut. It's, you know, whatever's up to you and uh, that's how to do that template version. So I'll take, I'll take this to the sewing machine, I'll do a couple of pictures, and then we'll talk about the paper piecing version. Back in a moment. All 
right, so there is the piece version, and you can see I pressed all in one direction, but if you'd prefer to press all in one direction, or towards the dark, or towards the light, or open it up again, it's your quilt, no quilt police here. So let's move on to the other method I talked about, which was my favorite paper piecing. All right, you saw just a little while ago how I traced these, and I have made photocopies of it, so I have enough for everything. It's four per each block. I have, there's that uh, corner piece, and there's the square, and of course they'll match up like this in the block when it's finished. So let me just review what I do, okay? I like to pre-fold all of my edges, all of my, you know, seams that I'm going to be doing, and that's just a personal preference because it makes it easier for me to move forward quickly when I get going. And I do this with all of my pieces before I get going. Let's see, there's one and two folds. Again, these are pretty easy blocks because they're symmetrical, as in they're the same both ways. Because remember, paper piecing is actually a mirrored version of the block that you're gonna be finishing, but it doesn't matter because these are the same thing whichever way. So to show you, like, there's, and there's the back. All right. So let's talk about just what I do, and I'll just pick this one over here as an example. This is all my fabric, and you can see they're all really bigger than the pieces that are needed for the actual block, so that's good. So you won't have any problems if you decide to do this paper piecing route. I like to use a little glue to get me started and I just put a little dab there in the center and that's basically just there for me to hold the piece of fabric in place while I flip back and forth. So I have my center piece, that's the number one, that's that pretty dark green and I'm just gonna use the folds as kind of a, a, a landing pad, a guidance. I want to make sure that I go over both of those folds on both sides at least a quarter of an inch and see how much bigger my piece is. That's great. You can actually see it. The, the fabric goes through right here and right here. So I have this, and like I said, I just used that glue to kind of hold the fabric in place. I'm gonna fold number two back. Now you can, uh, you wanna cut away the extra and you can grab your regular ruler just by setting it on a quarter inch line and cutting away the extra or you can grab one of my favorite tools, which is the add a quarter ruler, and it's got this little lip. Let's see if I can put it in the light so you can see it. So it's got a little lip that butts up right next to the paper piece. So it butts up right there, and that's a quarter of an inch, so that way I know I can swipe away all that extra. And that's gonna give me a nice straight line and ready for placement when I go to flip it over. So I flip it over again, and I take my other piece, this is for piece number two, and I line it up against that piece. Now if you need to, you can just overlap by a quarter and make sure it's gonna cover that entire piece, and I'm going to be fine here, that little extra is just extra piece of paper. But that's a good tip to make sure your fabric is bigger if not, I've seen a lot of people that have placed it over and then like hold it up to the light just to make sure it's gonna actually cover where they need to cover. Remember, you want to make sure that your fabric is at least a quarter of an inch bigger all the way around. I like to tell people three eighths because, you know, bigger is better. I'm gonna take a pin, I'm gonna put it through all three pieces, the two pieces of fabric and the paper, and I'm putting it as far away from where I'm going to be doing that seam as possible. That way my pin doesn't get caught underneath the sewing foot when I go to sew. So I'm gonna take this to the sewing machine, I'm gonna start right there at that point, and I'm gonna stitch along that line between pieces one and two. I'm gonna go all the way through even that quarter of an inch seam. I'm gonna open that piece of fabric up and press it, and then I'm gonna come back and we're gonna do that second piece together too. So, to the sewing machine. All right, there we go, I've done the stitch. And remember, when you're doing paper piecing, you want to shorten your stitch length. I think I'm using 
uh, 1.5, 2.0, something smaller because that's going to make more perforation through the paper, which will make it easier to tear off at the very end. All right, so now it's time to do that other side. We're going to fold the line between one and three. Give it a nice smooth down. I'm going to grab my add a quarter ruler. And if you want one of these, I'll put a link in the description below. Or you can ask your a local quilt shop to order it for you. All right, we'll open it back up. We'll grab that third piece of fabric. Line it up there. Throw the pin in. And we do the same thing. And this time I can go all the way through both of those seam allowances because I don't have to worry about this side now. All right, to the machine. All right, so there's the three pieces. It's are all done. You can see I've gone beyond all of that quarter of an inch, which is perfect. So now the last step is to trim off all of this extra. So grab your ruler. I'm gonna put this on that quarter of an inch seam outside and swipe away and I'm going to do those little dog ear points on the two sides too at the very end because that's going to help me when I go to piece this at the very end. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna eyeball it. Just like I did the last time. Alright, so there we go. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. The final step before you go on is just tearing that uh, that paper away, and I tear in the opposite order. So we did piece one, two, three. So we start with three. I give it a little fold. I use my nail to help those preparations, and then it's just a little pull away. If you find any piece like stuck underneath when you get to the very end, you can just grab a a pin or use your fingernail to help get it out from underneath that thread. And I just like to pull that last piece. There we go. So do that. Whichever method, you're going to do four of the corner pieces and four of the squares. Remove the paper, of course, if you're doing my paper piecing method. And then once you have all these pieces, grab those five squares, the uh, one center piece and then those four outside pieces, and let's move on to the next step. All right, so gather all your pieces, and I've kind of laid mine out the way the block will look at the end, and let's talk about the next step. Obviously, the corners are the last piece of the puzzle, so we need to focus on this nine patch here in the center. So as you can imagine, we're going to want to first make them into rows, and then put those rows together to make that final block. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a few pictures as I go so you can see my process. I'm going to do these three pieces and then make the rows. I'm going to actually press towards the uh, main blocks, those unpieced ones, because that's going to be easier and it's going to have a flatter uh, fold when we go to press everything. And it'll be a nice nesting point for those four corners here in the center because everything's going to be going in opposite ways. So let me take a few pictures as I go. Uh, let me see, uh, I don't have to worry about any seams right here, but when I go to put the big piece together with these corners, we are gonna talk about some, some special pinning that I'm going to be doing. So let's get going with that center. I'll take a few pictures and I'll see you at the end of this process. To the machine. Alright, before I do this last part, I just want to take a moment and tell you a few things that I do at the machine and uh, pin-wise. 
uh, just as, as some extra tips. I know we talked about, let me flip them over, that I'm pressing in different directions and pressing towards those solid squares because that's where that nesting is happen. So I'm just gonna show you what I do with my pins and give you another option if you don't like the way that I pin. So what I do is, of course, I, I butt those two nests, those two folds up against each other. That's what we call the nest so that you see them going in different directions. And I actually take my pin and I go through the seam on one side and hopefully I hit the seam on the other one, which I did right there. And that's what I typically do when I'm butting up those two seams. Let me show you a different way though. So it's the same way that the two folds are butting up next to each other, the, you know, the nest. And I'm still going to put one pin through the seam and just make sure I aiming up and I hit the other one, which I do. But instead, I'm gonna actually take this one out because I'm gonna put two pins in and I'm gonna put one on either side of the seam. Some people prefer this method as opposed to having uh, one go through the seam. And the idea is that it just gives just a little extra security and you make sure nothing, you know, the fabric doesn't move around when you're at the machine. Because we know that sometimes machines will pull a little differently on the, the top as opposed to the bottom. Um, if you want to use your walking foot, I use a FOF, which has uh, an attachment to the foot automatically that pulls both ways. I also like to throw in a couple of pins at each end, and that's just what I do. It's just to help keep those fabrics from moving around. And I'm actually going to sew with the piecing part on top this one right here because I know that that's a quarter of an inch so I know that when I'm seaming along when I'm stitching down the line that I need to make sure that I hit just right there so that way when I press it open it'll have a nice crisp point and I did that even when I did the rows too when I put the rows together I seam right with this part on top so that you can see the stitch line I'm really just going right at the edge of that of that dot anyway i just wanted to point that give a couple of options little extra tips to help you make really accurate points and i'm going to do this stitch and we'll be back in just a moment all right so there's that pretty nine patch there in the center and feel free to press the way you like to i pressed towards the center this time let me show you the one i did i actually pressed open on that first one just to see how they lie a little differently and i love batiks they they lie pretty flat which i, I think is awesome um so let's talk about the next step the next step is adding these corner pieces and i actually do them two at a time when i take it to the machine so i do the two opposites and then i press and then i go back and i do the other two opposites and and remember how we talked about those notches so those notches are going to fit up with the sides of that square. See how that fits right there and right there? It's perfect, love, love, love. I also wanna give a shout out to our pattern designers. They are actually giving sizes of these finished squares, like this square they give a size for, they give a squ uh, size for how, how big this square should measure. So go ahead and you know measure it and make sure it's adding up because that way you know you are on track and this block is gonna be the size it needs to. Um, let me give me give you one more tip before I move on. So this is gonna be a, a, a really important a matching so let me bring this one in so you see how those are supposed to match and I've done, done pretty good with most of them um, let me show you what I did so that it helps match out we know that we want to do a quarter of the seam and I actually took my ruler and I actually just did a little a little line on these quarters this is what I did because you know I'm aiming for accuracy right so I got my quarter right there at the edge of that fabric and I know that right there and right there that's where the pin needs to go through for that to match up with over on this side okay so when I go to pin we know that these are supposed to be quarter of an inches right there where that crosses so I throw the pin through that little point 
right there and I'm going to aim for that line right there just inside so I know that that's where it's supposed to hit and I'm going to do that to both sides and I'm going to take it to the machine this way so that I know that I'm hitting those points and uh, get a nice crisp like it's supposed to look like a, an oblong diamond so that I get that is it perfect on all of them no but like I said I like to aim for as perfect as possible so I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do two sides at once I'll take a few pictures I'll do the other sides and then at the end we will have a finished block yay we're so close guys let me uh, take this to the machine and I'll see you in just a moment There we go. We have finished the block. Let me turn it over so you can show the difference of the two blocks that I did. Just a little bit of uh, difference in pressing. And like I said, no no judgment here. No, no quilt police here. Do what you need to do to get these blocks done. Give them a nice best press. Make sure they're nice and flat. Congratulations on finishing the two dog tooth violets. And hey, let's move on. Let's get going. Let's do month number seven. So I'll see you in my next video. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, that thumbs up. Help me out. Take a look at the links below for all the good information and some of the products that I use in this video. And I will see you next time in my quilt lab. This is Cynthia saying keep quilting. Bye-bye.